Hello everyone. Welcome to the First Unitarian Society of Milwaukee's online worship service. I'm Reverend Dina McFeeters and I'm honored to serve as Associate Minister. We welcome people of all genders, sexualities, ages, races, ethnicities, histories, and bodies. We welcome your mind, your heart, and your spirit. We welcome all that you are carrying with you today and all that your heart longs to set down. We'd like to pay a special welcome to guests joining us today. If you're visiting for the first time or joining us from afar, why don't you say hello in the chat and tell us where you're joining us from. I welcome you to our worship service today by inviting you to repeat our mission after me. We gather to nurture the spirit, engage the mind, and inspire action. Let's return to our beloved sanctuary for the lighting of the flaming chalice symbol of Unitarian Universalism. Good morning. My name is Patrick Mulvey, and I'm honored to be your worship associate today. They say the truth will set you free, but I'm not so sure about that. Some of you know my son, Sam, and maybe some of you know that he has a mild form of muscular dystrophy. Spoiler alert, if you didn't know, you couldn't tell, and he's all set to live a long and healthy life. I asked him if it was okay for me to share this with you, and he said, of course. It's not his MD I want to tell you about today. It's the story of how I came to find out he has it, and what it was like to live through that process. When Sam's mother and I were getting ready to have kids, we talked a bit about MD. We knew his grandmother was a carrier because she'd been tested and because one of Sam's cousins has MD. MD is an X-linked recessive genetic condition. And that means that women can be carriers, but almost never have MD themselves. It also involves a series of coin flips, 50-50 chances. If a woman is a carrier, there's a 50-50 chance she can pass the gene on to her children. And generally, your chances of having a son or a daughter are 50-50 each again. So, Sam's grandmother is a carrier. We knew that meant there was a 50-50 chance his mother could also be a carrier. Turns out, she is. Strike one. Then we knew there was a 50-50 chance we'd have a son, which we did. Strike two. Finally, we knew there was a 50-50 chance he'd have the gene. He does. Strike three. We've lost all three coin flips. In the weeks following Sam's diagnosis, when he was about two years old, I began to get less and less sleep. In my waking moments, my mind was constantly occupied with unwelcome thoughts about mortality. What if I had a heart attack and left Sam without a dad? What if he drowned in the kiddie pool or died of SIDS? What if he suffered at all? What have we done to this poor, beautiful boy? How much would he hate us for passing on this gene? How much would it hurt him to be rejected by girls when he got older? What about all the sports he could never play? There was no end to my mind's ability to fabricate doom for him and me. I agonized over these thoughts all the time. Nightmares about harm coming to Sam plagued what little sleep I was getting. His mother was conflict avoidant, and so I couldn't talk to her about it. I asked our family doctor for a referral to a neuromuscular clinic so that we could make parenting decisions with better information. His response was obstructive, derisive even, as though I were foolish for pursuing it, and like I was too ignorant to use the information if I had it. I was alone with my grief and mourning so many possible bad outcomes even when I held my gorgeous little guy in my arms and listened to his uncontainable laughter. Finding out the truth, that Sam had MD, 
did not set me free. Instead, it trapped me in a prison of despair. This, for me, was the brutal truth that most parents learn, one way or another, early in their journey. No matter how desperately we wish we could, we cannot get in between them and the harm the world has in store for them. Since then, I've often said I never really knew what fear was until I had children. Around this time, I saw an interview with Larry King uh, and a young man who had been born without arms or legs. This handsome guy had competed on both his high school and college wrestling teams and had worked as a male model. In the interview, his bright and grateful disposition shone clearly. As I watched, I imagined what his parents might have gone through in his first years, how they might have suffered from some of the same terrible thoughts I had experienced. And then a thought occurred to me. I pictured them talking about how they could help their child, and I felt certain that they had reached a decision that not only would they commit to always telling their son he could do anything he wanted, but they would mean it. They had to believe deep down in their bones that when they said it to him, it was true without hesitation or uncertainty. And that way their son would know it was true too. Of course, I'll never know if they actually had this conversation, but it doesn't matter. In my mind, I had heard them come to that conclusion and I decided to come to it also. And in the end, that has made all the difference. I have always told Sam he can do whatever he wants, and I always believed it to be true, every time. And it still is. Of course, he's 19 now, so sometimes it seems like all he wants to do is stay up all night playing video games and binging Netflix, and then sleeping till 5 p.m. But along the way, he took gymnastics, he learned parkour, he played soccer and basketball, rode his bike all over creation, still does, went on the mission trip with our youth group and helped build homes, marched in the Black Lives Matter protests, and still camps with me every year on Rock Island. Almost every time he and his sister asked for help with just about anything, I told them they could probably do it themselves and that they should try. Of course, I was there just in case. I wanted them both to know that my assumption is that they're competent people and most things are doable by them. This became a truth in my parenting. Unlike the truth of Sam's diagnosis, this one helped me, and I hope it's helped them too. I don't know. Both things are probably true, that I can't protect my children from everything, but I can still arm them with confidence in their ability to make their way in the world. The one truth I felt was like something that happened to us. We fell victim to it. The other truth is one that I had to choose, I had to commit to, and in so doing, manifest it. I'm not sure which is the true truth, but I know I'm a lot happier with where I ended up than I am with where I started.
Both science and religion are driven by the desire to know, science to know the facts, religion to know what to believe, yet a sense of wonder and even mystery can pervade both pursuits. For noted astronomer Carl Sagan, the spiritual had to be rooted in natural reality. He cherished those ideas about the cosmos that remained after the most rigorous experiment and observation. Scientific insight made him feel something, a soaring sensation, a recognition that he could only compare to falling in love. And as he used to say, when you're in love, you want to tell the world. So wrote his wife and co-writer Anne Druyen in the foreword to Sagan's best-selling book, Cosmos. The scientist who revealed the first images taken by NASA's James Webb Space Telescope showed a similar passion, don't you think? If you watch the live feed on the New York Times website on July 12th, or read any of the news coverage since, a sense of wonder pervades the passion for knowledge about the universe. There are so many galaxies in here, wrote Marina Corin in the Atlantic Magazine about the first deep field image released. Those bright spiky points are nearby stars, she wrote, but every tiny oval, every gleaming blob is a distant galaxy, a swirling creation brimming with stars and dust and planets. Some of the galaxies in the foreground are part of a cluster called SMACS 0723, so massive that its gravity warps the light coming from other more distant galaxies. The effect magnifies their brightness, bringing thousands of them out of the darkness. The cosmic gems fill up every corner of the frame. Each one captured the way it appeared billions of years ago when the starlight left its shimmery edges and began wafting across the universe. The picture is sparkly and beautiful, a great choice for a computer background. It is also, more important, an entirely new view of the universe. The light from the galaxies in the foreground left 4.6 billion years ago, and the light from the galaxies beyond those even longer. All this light has been captured in unprecedented detail by the most powerful space telescope in history, making this one of the deepest, most high resolution pictures of the universe that humankind has ever taken. Scientists are giddy, she wrote, eager to dive into the data behind the pretty pictures. This is a bunch of space agencies shouting to the public, look, this $10 billion space telescope that we've spent more than 25 years working on, it works. It works beautifully. But on a deeper level, the image represents something else, a cosmic leveling up of sorts. Here we are on this little ball of rock in a boundless universe, when we have managed to glimpse the universe as it was billions of years before we even existed. We have stretched our perception of the universe from the night sky to the planets to other suns and other galaxies. And soon we'll catch the light that's even older, even farther from us, closer to the big, mysterious moment when the universe began. Hmm. I'm not usually interested in astronomy. I'm a gardener with her head looking down and her hands in the soil. 
but the flurry of excitement over the beautiful images from the James Webb Space Telescope show a connection between the scientific way of knowing and the religious way of knowing. Both are trying to answer essential questions. What happened at the beginning of time and thereafter? How did we get here? What does it mean to be human in the vastness of the universe? The results of science can help answer those questions. If we are open to new knowledge, if we are open to learning and change, but if we believe in orthodoxy, literally right belief, such as the religious belief that God created the world in seven days, then we are not going to let in new images of the universe and their scientific interpretation. We are not going to change our minds when new truths are revealed because we are wedded to the truth with a capital T Sometimes even scientists can be orthodox and resist new discoveries. In Dale Peterson's biography of Jane Goodall, he wrote, when Louis Leakey first heard about Jane Goodall's discovery that, chimpan that chimpanzees fashion and use tools, he sent her a telegram that read, now we must redefine tool, redefine man, or accept chimpanzees as human. Until that moment, Leakey, like many of his scientific peers, had relied on the standard definition of human as man the toolmaker. But when Goodall first presented her discoveries at a scientific conference, she was ridiculed by the powerful chairman who warned one of his distinguished colleagues not to be misled by her glamour. She was too young, too blonde, too pretty to be a serious scientist. And worse yet, she had virtually no scientific training. She had been a secretarial school graduate when Leakey, unable to find someone with the right credentials, sent her out to study chimps. And once she was in the field, he couldn't tell her what to do. Nobody could, because no one before had made such an intensive and long-term study of wild apes. Unitarian Universalism embraces new discoveries. Show us what you found, astronomers. Tell us what you learned, Jane Goodall. We assert that revelation is not sealed truth, with a lowercase t, is continually being revealed in a wide variety of places through a wide variety of methods, including your own direct experience, encountering that transcending mystery and wonder affirmed in all cultures, which moves us to a renewal of the spirit and an openness to the forces that create and uphold life as stated in our first UU source. We could say that Unitarian Universalism is a religion of little t truths. What does that mean? It means that in our faith community, no one is expected to prove that they believe in a big T truth. Because what we know changes over time as we shed naivete and grow in maturity throughout our lives, our knowing deepens. The educators among us might be familiar with James Fowler's Stages of Faith, which is one model of lifelong faith development. Fowler drew on theories from Piaget, Erickson, and Kohlberg to define six stages humans experience while we grow up and figure out the meaning of our lives. As I tell you the stages, as summarized by our UUA Tapestry of Faith program, listen for what rings true for you, or as you witness the children in your life in their development.
The first stage is actually called a pre-stage named undifferentiated faith, ages birth through two years. In this stage, the seeds of trust, courage, hope, and love are planted and contend with sensed threats of abandonment, inconsistency, and deprivation. What develops in this pre-stage underlies or undermines all that comes later in faith development. At this stage, children experience faith as a connection between themselves and their and their caregiver. Stage one is called intuitive projective faith, ages three to five. The cognitive development of children of this age is such that they were unable to think abstractly and are generally unable to see the world from anyone else's perspective. Faith is not a thought out set of ideas, but instead a set of impressions that are largely gained from their parents or other significant adults in their lives. Stage two, mythic literal faith, is generally ages six through 12. Children at this age start to work out the difference between verified facts and things that might be fantasy or speculation. Their source of religious authority starts to expand past parents and trusted adults to others in their community, like teachers and friends. Like the previous stage, faith is something to be experienced. At this stage, children think in concrete and literal ways. Faith becomes the story told and the rituals practiced. Later in this stage, children begin to have the capacity to understand that others might have different beliefs than them. Stage three, synthetic conventional faith, generally starts about the age of 13 and goes until around 18. However, some people stay at this stage for their entire life. Unlike previous stages, people at this stage can think abstractly. What were once simple, unrelated stories and rituals can now be seen as a more cohesive narrative about values and morals. At this stage, people start to have the ability to see things from someone else's perspective. This means that they can also imagine what others think about them and their faith. People at this stage claim their faith is their own instead of just being what their family does. However, the faith that is claimed is usually still the faith of their family. Issues of a religious authority are important to people at this stage. For younger adolescents, that authority still re resides mostly with their parents and important adults. For older adolescents and adults in this stage, authority resides with friends and religious community. For all people in this stage, religious authority relies, resides mostly outside of them personally. Hmm. Stage four, individuative reflective faith usually starts in late adolescence, 18 to 22 years old. People start to question their own assumptions around the faith tradition. They start to question the authority structures of their faith. This is often the time that someone will leave their religious community if the answers to the questions they are asking are not to their liking. Greater maturity is gained by rejecting some parts of their faith while affirming other parts. The person starts to take greater ownership of their own faith journey. Stage five, conjunctive faith. People do not usually get to this stage until their early 30s. This stage is when the struggles and questioning of stage four give way to a more comfortable place. Some answers have been found, and the person at this stage is comfortable knowing that all the answers might not be easily found. 
In this stage, the strong need for individual self-reflection gives way to a sense of the importance of community. People are more open to other people's faith perspectives. This is not because they are moving away from their faith, but because they have a realization that other people's faiths might inform and deepen their own. Stage six is called universalizing faith. And this is when I get annoyed with these kind of models because Fowler predictably says, it is a rare person who reaches this stage of faith. People at this stage have a special grace that makes them seem more lucid, more simple, and yet somehow more fully human than the rest of us. People at this stage can become important religious teachers because they have the ability to relate to anyone at any stage and from any faith. They are able to relate without condescension but at the same time are able to challenge the assumptions that those of other stages might have. People at this stage cherish life, but also do not hold on to life too tightly. They put their faith in action, challenging the status quo and working to create justice in the world. People like Gandhi and Mother Teresa are examples of people who have reached this stage. Okay, I guess we do need a stage to aspire to. It's interesting to notice that Fowler assumes people are raised in a faith tradition, and not everybody is, of course. I'm curious to know whether those who are not raised in a religious tradition find any resonance with this model. I do appreciate having somewhat of a map for faith development, because just as humans grow and develop, our beliefs develop and change over time also. This is not only normal, but fascinating. You use are often so passionate about the process of seeking little t truths that we sometimes resist finding them. But we do find them. What are the truths that you have found? How do they guide your life? In the Soul Matters packet for this month on the theme of knowing, Reverend Scott Taylor challenges us with a question. He asks, what do you know so well or so deeply that you could state, thou shalt not, fill in the blank, or everyone shall, fill in the blank. We you use never want to be seen as dogmatic, but don't we all hold at least one piece of knowledge that seems universal or necessary? Something that we just can't or won't compromise on? Something we would defend no matter what? Patrick began his worship associate story by questioning the phrase, the truth will set you free which comes from the Gospel according to John, chapter 8, verse 31, when Jesus says, If you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. In Parker Palmer's book, To Know As We Are Known, education as a spiritual journey. He wrote, Christian faith in its original version is centered on a person who said, I am the truth. Jesus did not say, I will speak true words to you, or I will tell you about the truth. He claimed to embody truth in his person. To those who wish to know truth, Jesus did not offer propositions to be tested by logic or data to be tested in the laboratory. He offered himself and his life. Those who sought truth were invited into relationship with him and through him 
with the whole community of the human and non-human world. During our worship associate retreat, when we discussed, what is knowing? What does it mean to know? Kevin Gibson, our resident philosophy professor, said, knowing is what's called a verification system. To know something means that you can verify it. However, he continued, there are types of knowing, such as love, that I cannot prove, but that I can assert and would lay my life on it. I think those are the kind of truths we long to find and help each other embody in relationship, dare I say, like Jesus did. And if Jesus is not a role model for you, look to the truths embodied by your stage six wise sage of choice. Friends, may we offer ourselves and our lives to each other, knowing the truth of relationship will set us free. May it be so. Dear ones, I'll leave you with these closing words by Arthur Foote. May peace dwell within our hearts and understanding in our minds. May courage steal our wills and love of truth forever guide us. May it be so. We are going, heaven knows where we are going, we know within, and we will get there, heaven knows how we will get there, but we know. Oh yeah, yeah, oh yeah, yeah, oh yeah, yeah.